Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is Delta Green Control Group for Delta Green the Role-Playing Game by Arc Dream Publishing. In this video I'll be reviewing the second scenario of the four contained within, Night Visions. There'll be spoilers from this point on, so stop watching now if you intend to play this. The scenario begins in war-torn Afghanistan in October 2011. The group of soldiers, who are part of the 1st Squad of the 1st Rifle Platoon of Charlie Company of the 2nd Battalion of the 35th Infantry of the 3rd Infantry Brigade Combat Team of the 25th Infantry Division. They're stationed in the northern Kunar province at Combat Outpost Honaka Miracle. The regiment is known as the Cacti and are halfway through a 12-month tour. It is one of the roughest zones in the war. Their tour so far has been a mixture of boredom and terror. The game is run on a group of pre-gen characters where they play Fireteam Alpha. The first one to be decided on is Foreign Service Officer Samantha Sutterberg, followed by Staff Sergeant Kryptowitz. Once these are settled upon, the rest of the team consists of Team Leader Clifton and three riflemen. There is also a translator, Yasir Marwat, involved. The organisational structure is detailed here, and a few handouts of information to read to the players are here. It gives us some information on northern Kunar province, describing it as a place of fertile valleys and dusty plains with dirt tracks as roads between towns and villages. The nine soldiers are called to a meeting at 0800 hours by the platoon leader, Lieutenant Nagel, who introduces Samantha Sutterberg, someone who is clearly a civilian. Nagel explains that she is from the State Department and that Kryptowitz is to take her and a translator along with the platoon medic to a place called Gath Valley. There, Sutterberg and Kryptowitz are to negotiate with the local tribe, the Gaths. They are to deliver gifts for them, with the hope of coming home with a concrete agreement for cooperation against the Taliban and the promise of being able to build an outpost there. Gath Valley is only four kilometres from their base, though they have not heard of it. Sutterberg gives a presentation along these lines, and there are a list of potential questions and answers given on the next page. The soldiers could potentially know a little bit about the Gath, and it details what each soldier can know. The general consensus is that they are sexual deviants, the valley has mountain winds that prevent air support, and that they are considered wicked, and in an American context, in the same ballpark as inbred hillbillies. They can find out that the valley is riddled with caves, and that a river flows through it, and that they have dammed it, making it extremely difficult to get into with the prevailing unpredictable mountain winds. The Gath have held the valley against all comers since time immemorial. Once all questions have been asked, they are told to pack gear for five days and be ready to roll in 60 minutes. They will take three MATVs to the valley, make a deal with them and get back before the Taliban can set up an ambush. The next section covers the kind of questions that Sutterberg could face and the answers she can give. The whole purpose of speaking to the Gath is to make Gath Valley a defensible position while attempting to gather up the marginalised elements of Afghan society under one national identity. The soldiers can discover that nobody really knows where the Gath came from and that they are culturally distinct from their neighbours. They're said to be armed with Russian weapons and are faced with bigotry and mistrust from all others. It then details the MATVs that the soldiers use and then shifts back to the soldiers' own investigations into the Gath. If they manage to reach out to the right people, they can discover that pilots are recommended not to fly over the valley due to wind hazards and that the Russians had similar protocol in the 1980s. If they do an internet search, they can find two important articles. One with a failure, both with success. The first is a Wikipedia-esque informational document that provides some good information. They can discover that the Gath have long been suspected of opium growth and that they claim to have come from a land far to the east. Accounts of infidels of abominable habits called the Gathi reach back as far as 720 AD. They're geographically isolated and poor and on occasion they leave their people and head out into the world. The central figures of their religion are known as the Tiuthan, which is said to be intermediaries between the Gath and their god. Their society is said to be matriarchal. The second article, which is found on a successful role, is entitled My Summer with the Gaths, and is from someone's ethnographic report of the subcultures of the Hindu Kush Mountains. It recounts the story of someone who went to stay with them for two weeks in the summer of 1989. The Gath are confused that the person, who was female, didn't travel with chaperone or family. They asked if she was under the protection of a sky howler. It's revealed that they speak Pashto, but also their own dialect. The author writes that she found them extremely respectful and that she was offered a savoury meat dumpling called a kunkalu, which was odd as they were clearly suffering from malnutrition. The valley is described as beautiful yet austere. The valley is dammed, creating a fishing lake at the entrance and that the Gath were constantly examining and repairing it. The author spoke of an old man called Aftha who told her that before the revolution a group of government soldiers tried to enter the valley but the dam crumbled under the weight of their vehicle. 
If the soldiers speak with the local Afghan people who work at the base, they can discover that the opinion is the Ghats are primitives, and the only reason they've not been destroyed is that their land is worthless. It's also claimed that the Gath abduct young girls. Also, when the Russians tried to take a helicopter into the valley, the Gath whistled it down with demons that they sleep with. The translator, Yasir Mawat, is the next to arrive. He's many hours late, but is a friendly sort, and has a handful of crates in his truck of gear that he has traded for the Gath. There are a few Type 69 RPGs, to which Sutterberg will remind them that they had strict orders to not arm the Gath. Yasir has traded half of the food, vitamins and medicine for weaponry, as he believes that the Gath will find this stuff to be useless. He will advise that there are around 500 Gath in the valley, though that is only counting the adults. With Yasir and the trading stock in tow, the soldiers finally set off to the valley. They follow a riverbed with a trickle of a stream running down it and eventually come to a dirt track that leads up and across the dam into Gath Valley. The dam is around 5 metres tall and made of stone, wood and thickened mud, showing signs that it has been repaired many, many times. It will quickly become apparent that the MATVs will not be able to get into the valley, however Yesia's truck can. It gives some rules for bursting the dam should that happen. This will reveal the skeletons of the Teuthan that have been dumped there over the centuries. They resemble crystalline structures more than bones. Next, we move on to meeting the Gath. They're greeted by guards as they enter the valley and are slightly confused as to what to make of them. They will be stiff and reserved and allow Sutterberg, Marwat and the soldiers into the valley. The Gath themselves are heavily tanned, have sallow skin with grey eyes and flat faces, straight hair and epicanthic folds that tell of an eastern origin. They show clear signs of malnutrition with pale gums and dull mottled teeth, with some of them walking in a stiff manner due to weak musculature and joints. The women are unveiled and they all dress in layers of robes. The men have bowl-headed hair and fist-sized beards. They are all incredibly clean. After milling about with the villagers, the soldiers will notice that the shorter the gath, the healthier they look, and a few have square scars around two inches aside on their arms and legs. The truth about the gath is that around 1500 years ago in Thailand, an ethnic group acquired an unnatural patron and left for Afghanistan, living in Gath Valley ever since. Their DNA would be very interesting to a geneticist. In actuality, there are around a thousand gath, though around a third of them live outside the valley, living in Qatar or Singapore. Only around 10% of those want to return. When they leave, they are told that bad things will befall them if they fail to return when summoned, though this is untrue. There are 562 adults and 221 children living there where they grow crops for food and opium for trade. They herd in the hills and fish in their lake. They worship their unnatural patron, an entity called Abdaleth, and obey their leader, the Ormat. The village is largely run on battery power and the stream is the only water there. They speak some Pashto as well as their own dialect and know a handful of English words. We then have a map of the valley showing all of the locations and then it moves on to describing it. It is green, sheltered and irrigated, with looming valley walls growing stubborn pines from cracks and ledges. It has a swampy smell near the lake and dam. Noises echo off the walls and the silences are hushed. There are poppy and wheat crops growing here, with most of the stone and mortar houses having scruffy gardens with the odd mouldy pomegranate tree. The lake has fishermen that live next to it. At the far end of the village is a six metre tall structure, the seat of the Ormat. This has a stable with horses and mules alongside a garage that contains tools and vehicles, a jeep, two light trucks and one with a machine gun mounted on it alongside four dirt bikes. Three gath accompany the visitors at all times. If they need to sleep there, they'll be offered quarters in the weighing cave. More on that in a bit. The food they offer visitors is poultry and those versed in such things will understand that good manners in Afghanistan requires giving visitors your very best, something the gath are not doing. Should the soldiers talk to the fishermen, they will see that they have numerous Kunkalu marks. The weighing cave contains benches, chairs and old car seats and two seesaws. There is also an oven that is roaring hot where fresh meat is being cooked. If the gather asks, they will advise that the meat is for the Ormat. The two seesaws have granite blocks on one end and a seat at the other, one with a slightly smaller block. If asked, the gather will tell them that they are the scales for weighing men and women and will look puzzled if asked why, saying that it is for the Ormat. At the back of the cave is the infirmary, more on that in a bit. There's a storage cave that is full of rifles, ammo, hand grenades and military rations. The seat of the Ormat is a two-storey building that is covered in human skulls that go back generations, some with filling still in their teeth. The roof has a heavy machine gun mounted on top. One of the caves is known as the Cave of the Source. This is where Abdaleth appears and the marriage with the Ormat occurs. This is a sacred place to the Gath and the walls are covered with a kind of rainbow sheen similar to the top of oil. This is caused when Abdaleth comes into three dimensions. 
The soldiers will be chased from this place by the Gath and will be attacked if they vandalise it. The next section moves to the questioning of the Gath themselves. It details Kathka, the Gath's doctor. She only has one leg due to an accident when she was younger and as such sits in a wheelchair and doesn't suffer from the malnourishment that the other Gaths do. She is smart and talented, which is surprising given the mishmash of medical and surgical equipment she has to use. She is overjoyed to have visitors and will marvel at their size. She is generous with her opium to anybody who is injured. She speaks Pashto and is chattier than the other Gath. The soldiers can find out quite a bit about the Gath from her, including what the seesaws are for, who is in charge, who the Ormat is, and even if they eat human flesh, with her commenting ominously that they should not worry as they are safe. She has two answers, one for early in the day and one for later in the day when she feels she can trust them a bit more. It gives a raft of questions that the players can ask the Gath, including information on the Teothan, they're the children of the Ormat, Abdaleth, the Sky Howler who lives above them, what the ritualistic scars are, marks from when they do not give enough to the tribe, and what a kunkalu is, a toasted wheat dumpling mixed with meat and blood that only the Orma can eat, though this is described as ceremonial. It details an encounter with some of the younger Gath men, where they indicate that the Taliban have been eaten, and even details what happens should one of the soldiers want to get laid. The next section details two Taliban soldiers that have been captured by the Gath. They're being held in a secure stone room, and the Gaths do not object to the soldiers talking to them. The Taliban can be cajoled into talking with the soldiers, and being successful here could potentially save them later on. With the right roles, it can be determined that the Taliban went after the Gath after they tried to steal a girl from a local village. They will be told that the Gath are sorcerers, and that the Gath women are whores of shaitan that produce monstrous offspring that can fly, and the only thing that can protect them is the devil blocking song, which is taught to the righteous folk of the region. If they are pressed on this, they can find out when the leader of the Gath sings, the children of shaitan appear. If the soldiers press them, the Taliban will agree to teach them the song on the condition that the soldiers remember them when the Gath turn on them. The Taliban claim that they are the most evil force in Afghanistan and that they would rather face a hundred American armies than the Gath. It then goes on to give details of the devil blocking him. This eerie melody is full of nonsense words, though it's actually the melody and rhythms that are important. Those who have talent in the musical arts have a better chance of learning it. When activated, it stops the Tuathan from coming within 10 metres of the singer for D4 turns. Whether this works against other unnatural entities is the Keeper's call. Should the soldiers flee without meeting the Ormat, they are intercepted by the Gath, who insist that the Ormat wishes to speak to them, and it will come to blows should they further resist. The next section covers the most important part of the scenario, meeting the Ormat. This will take place in the evening, and Sutterberg has the feeling that the Gath consider the Ormat to be akin to their Pope. She will insist that the soldiers are respectful. Before entering the seat of the Ormat, they will be required to leave their weapons outside, though knives are permitted. Once they enter the chamber, they will encounter a scene of uncomfortable luxury. The walls are carved with faces of expressions of surprise, amazement and anger, and are covered in geometric shapes made from spent shell casings. The floor is covered in carpets with giant cushions. After a few minutes, the Ormat is wheeled in on a gleaming carriage. The Ormat herself is in her mid-twenties and morbidly obese, being unable to walk more than a few steps. She has a round cherubic face with pierced ears decorated with long dago plastic bangles and has a gold chain that goes from her left ear to her nostril that has 9mm shell casings hanging from it. Her clothes are voluminous and elaborately woven with designs similar to Afghan rugs. She has a stain on her skin and hair of blackish rainbow swirls and half of her long hair is white. She has four attendants who wheel her out on a carriage made from spare car parts with wheels on each corner that are decorated with bells, rings and beads which chime discordantly as it moves. Next to her right hand is an immaculate M4 carbine and her left has a tray filled with cakes, figs, bread and the like. There is also a small elegant plate that has three Kunkalu dumplings on it. She will babble away to them in Gath which will be translated by Marwat or Pashto by a Gath. The Ormat will praise the power and size of the Americans stating that together they will destroy the Taliban. She will then reach for the M4, which may cause a moment of panic from the soldiers, and then hand it to Sutterberg, whom she assumes, having come from a matriarchal society, is their leader. She states that she is returning it as it was stolen by the Taliban, and now the Americans can show thanks to her for doing so. She will accept all praise with an enthusiastic smile. The Ormat then has some questions for the Americans. She will ask if great gods in the sky are worshipped in America, and whether the Americans want to take their land, food, and change their way of life. She will then ask if they will share food with her to seal the friendship. Marwat and Sutterberg insist that it would be offensive if they refuse, and if they agree, the Ormat claps her hand, smiling, and an attendant will bring a tray with a lancet, some bandages and cups, and proceed to take blood from all of the visitors. This, it will be explained, will be used to make the Kunkalu. They will be taken away and made into dumplings. It is expected that the visitors take part. 
The Ormat will eat one and comment on how strong their blood tastes, and this can cause a minor amount of sand loss. If they decline to eat one, the Ormat will be offended, though if they are calm about it, they will be told that a feast is being prepared for them. The Ormat will then proceed to answer any questions that the visitors will have for her. If asked why they are eating their blood, she will explain that their strength will flow into the village, and the children of Abdaleth the Sky Howler. If asked what a Sky Howler is, she will say that they protect and instruct the Gath. If asked if Abdaleth is a god, she will reply that Abdaleth is of sorts, and that there is a nameless and different creator to the cosmos that Abdaleth pays homage to. If asked what happens when Abdaleth comes, she will say that he marries a new Ormat and impregnates her with new Tuathan to protect the Gath, and the old Ormat ascends to heaven. If asked if they can see a Tuathan, they will be told that bringing them forward is difficult and painful, and only done so in times of great danger, but that if the Americans fight with the Gath, they will see one soon enough. We then move to the feast. It will arrive on beaten copper platters with wooden handles and is clearly the arms, legs, ribs and head of a Taliban prisoner. The attendants will stare salivating. The Ormat will then say, eat and bring our peoples together. This sight is sanity draining. Marwat will then vomit on the Ormat's carriage. Unless the soldiers smooth things out, the Ormat and their attendants will be outraged. How the soldiers leave the valley will depend on their reaction to the feast. If they react by attacking with knives or conceal weapons, the Gath will mount the truck with a gun on top and start firing at the soldiers. If the Ormat dies, the youngest Tuathan emerges from thin air and starts consuming the soldiers. It gives a turn-by-turn explanation of what happens as they flee. If the Ormat is not killed, the Tuathan will not emerge until the sixth turn, at which point it will fly across the valley ahead of the soldiers and destroy Bravo Team before coming back for Alpha Team. If the soldiers are okay about things and try to smooth things over, the Ormat will indicate that they should leave. If they don't, then it descends into a fight. When they leave, they find a crowd of Gath who will walk silently alongside them. After around a minute, a weird shrieking song can be heard and the Gath start chuckling and then leave, with only the younger, more bloodthirsty men hanging around to watch. A minute later, the oldest Tuathan emerges and darts across the valley to destroy Bravo Team, eventually coming back for Alpha. If the soldiers join the feast, it drains their sand and they can leave with the Ormat's blessing. As they leave, the eldest Tuathan emerges, not harming the soldiers or the Gath, and as before, darts across the valley to destroy Bravo Team. Alpha Team is allowed to leave in peace unless they attack. It gives details on how the soldiers can get out of the valley, which is around 300 metres long, and it also talks about how the Tuathan attack the soldiers and even their vehicles, though they will only pursue for three turns. The Gath attack in a much more random way, and the methods of escaping them are different skill checks depending on whether they are on foot or driving. We are reminded that sand loss due to violence comes with consequences and the deaths of their brothers in arms will have an effect on their bonds. It then moves to the aftermath of the trip to the Gath Valley. If they manage to escape, Lieutenant Nargill is horrified by what happened. They are interviewed by a civilian called Coretta Twain. If they talk about the Tuathan, she suggests that even though it sounds insane, if it's true it presents a serious security concern. If they don't mention it, she will carefully pick at their story, then produce a photograph of a soldier standing next to a two metre long severed human arm. She will tell them that the existence of these things is a tightly controlled secret, and if they want out, they need never talk about the Gath Valley again and take a medical discharge. However, if they want to know more, there is much more work to be done, and that a group in the government is responsible for dealing with threats of this nature, and are they interested in knowing more? If they leave Gath Valley under their own power after allying with the Gath, then they need to make persuade tests to keep it secret. If they fail, the patrol are accidentally killed by a drone strike of Hellfire missiles, Sutterberg and Marwa dying in ambush. Around a week after they return, the ground will shake and the sky will be lit up as a long-range cruise missile obliterates Gath Valley from existence. This, of course, never makes the news. If the soldiers all die, then the players take on the role of a group of drone pilots on a base in New Mexico. They've been watching a specific valley for a week when orders come through from Colonel Das that are to be obeyed without question. Other drones are massing over the valley, which may be recognised as the one related to the failed mission. A hellfire strike is ordered on a large building at the end after something large covered in a tarpaulin is wheeled in. The orders are given to launch all weapons at the building, which could annihilate all nearby. The drones after doing this are sent to distantly observe as a cruise missile hits the valley. Survivors are unlikely and it of course never makes the news. After this it gives the stats for the average gat and then moves on to the Tuathan. They are a genetic blend of human and unnatural. They are fairly stupid and sterile but extremely dangerous. They have long, thin torsos between 6 to 8 metres long and long, sloping faces with pronounced overbite and massive teeth. They have long, thin limbs with clear flesh and from behind their shoulders they have a horizontal fan that resembles a hand glider. They also have no legs and their torso has two long, bony fins. 
They glide through the air smoothly and are summoned by the Ormat with a shrill whistling song emerging from the air around her. Seeing them summoned is a terrifying encounter. Three inhabit the Ormat. They are deadly in combat and are invisible on night vision. After this, it gives the stats for Bravo Team, the medical specialist and Yassir Marwat the translator, and also the loads that the soldiers should be carrying. This is followed by the pregens. Night Visions is an excellent follow-on from Black Sat, even though the title seems to have nothing to do with the scenario. The change in tone and setting in taking on the roles of soldiers allows the players a bit more freedom to absorb the surroundings of Afghanistan, as all of the pregens are really well done and have distinct personalities. The knife edge that the players seem to sit on with regard to their dealings with the Gath is palpable throughout the writing. I am, as of recording this review, running this for my own home group, and it says something that the players felt more sympathy for the Taliban prisoners than the starving and miserable Gath. Their meagre existence is excellently realised, and the writing has been done with a fair amount of care with regard to how their valley is portrayed. It seems, on appearances, to be not that much different from how other tribes live in Afghanistan, until the horrific underbelly of their religion and the Ormat is exposed, and then to top it off, the Turthan are summoned, even in the event of a deal, where the players walk away and Bravo team is wiped out. One thing my players noticed in this, and also Black Sat in retrospect, is the way female characters are implemented. While in Black Sight you have a group of astronauts who are all working towards the same goal, the female doctor feels a bit separate from the others, and here Sutterberg is the only woman on the team, and as a stranger has none of the camaraderie associated with soldiers who are serving on a tour together. And while female soldiers were not allowed to fight in the front lines until 2013 according to Wikipedia, my group felt that a bit more could have been done to make the female characters feel a bit more included in the groups. This is, of course, just the opinion of my group. Your Delta Green may vary. The Teothan are horrific and dangerous enough without being overwhelming and don't stick around long enough to become a massive problem. However, I feel more could have been done with the Gat's unearthly patron Abdaleth, as they are only really briefly mentioned. Additionally, though a lot was made of the Valley's dangerous winds, nothing was done to demonstrate what happens, which I imagine could provide an excellent opportunity to showcase the Teothan as their most destructive. I think if done with the right atmosphere, Night Visions will provide a few nights of awful cannibalistic horror for your players that they will thoroughly enjoy, and it definitely fulfils one of the other myriad flavours that Delta Green has to offer. I give it a 9 out of 10. The next video in this series will be sick again, so until then, if you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I've put some links below. Lastly, if you like what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.